Hi, everyone. We will just be a few more minutes waiting for everyone else to come into the room. Um, but we will start shortly. Let's try around 1.40.
Muted. Hello, good evening. Um, we are just about ready to start the panel. I think a couple of our panelists are actually using the incorrect link. You're using the link for participants. So if you could please um, switch to the correct link for panelists, that will allow you to um, broadcast your presentations. That will allow you to share your screen so that we'll be able to see your presentations. So if you are receiving a message from me, um, uh, I think Alatunde Barber, um, anybody else who is on our panel, please do switch over to the correct link and we will start in just a couple of minutes. Thanks so much for your patience. Okay, I think we will begin now. Um, we will may have to switch around our schedule a little bit, but um, I don't want to lose any of the time that we have for uh, discussion. So I want to go ahead and get started. Um, hello, and welcome to session 3H and our panel on virtual art and virtuality, which may be more inclusively titled visual art and virtuality. A warm welcome and a big thank you to all of you viewers who are joining us today. Um, to briefly introduce myself, I am Olubukwala Gbadigeshen, Associate Professor of African American Studies and Art History at St. Louis University in St. Louis, Missouri. And it is my pleasure to serve as the chair of this panel. The papers will be presented in the order listed in the official program. I think we are having a little bit of a um, technical glitch. So we may actually um, switch and have um, Cindy, Cindy Lee McBride um, speak first. That's hopefully will be the only change we have to make. Um, I will introduce each panelist and their papers before they begin um, their 15 minute presentations. To the panelists, if you have a PowerPoint presentation, Please share your screen when you are introduced and begin your presentation after your introduction. Um, you will hear a soft beeping noise that sounds like this about two minutes before your time is up. When you hear that noise, please wrap up your presentation as best as you can in your remaining time. Um, after we hear each paper, we will have about 15 minutes for questions and discussions at the end. Um, for our audience, please jot down your questions and comments as we proceed so that we can have an engaging discussion. Unproductive or abusive comments will not be tolerated. Uh, much of our intellectual work is done in solitude so that when we can come together like this, it's all the more important that we support and advance each other's in our endeavors of the mind. Um, to that point, let's begin our panel. Uh, I think our first speaker is having some technical difficulties. So we will um, go ahead and uh, come back to Dr. Alatunde Barber. But for now, we will continue with our second speaker Oh wait, I think we see 
Dr. Barber. Hi. Hi, how are you? Okay, so we'll Fine, start. Thank with, you. We'll start with you then. Okay. Um, I, okay. Am, I, am I in the right one now? You are in the right one. Let me just briefly okay, ask good. that um, everybody mute your videos. And um, Dr. Um, Shabale, if you could please um, stop sharing your screen. You said? Um, somebody is, scared, is sharing their screen right now. So if we could have that person um, stop sharing your screen. Please do not share your screen yet. Okay. Okay. I, 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 I okay, you can go to the green button that says share screen. Has it been closed? Because I can't see, can see it now. Okay. You need to click on the green button that says share screen. There, now it's gone. Okay. Right? Now, okay. You, thank you. Yes. I'm going to go ahead and okay, introduce sure. our speaker. And as I'm introducing you, please do go ahead and share your screen and we'll begin the presentation after I'm done with your introduction. Okay, Dr. Latunde Barber is a curator, art historian and artist who studies the relations between the art and culture of Africa, the analysis of the power relationships in national and global cultural negotiations and the associated social knowledge constructions within the fields of museum and heritage studies. He holds a PhD from the School of Museum Studies, University of Leicester in the UK, and is currently the curator of the, Unite, of the University of Lagos Museum. Um, Dr. Barber is the secretary of the Abayomi Barber School of Thought, a member of the Society of Nigerian Artists and the ICOM. Please, Dr. Barber, if you could begin and tell us the new title of your presentation, because I think it's changed from what you um, submitted. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for um, pointing that out. Yeah. Um, there's a little trouble with um, the, the other research I was conducting. So I had to, I had to change it. If yeah. I could uh, for a quick second and ask that all the presenters, all the panelists mute your audio. So if you could just click on the microphone shaped icon on the bottom left of your screen, please. And then Dr. Barber, if you want to expand your presentation, you can click on the button to the left of the Zoom at the bottom right of your PowerPoint. Uh, can't find that here. Uh, it's, it's not the, expanded right now. No. Because, you know, initially, initially I couldn't see it. That's that's actually why I, I, I actually see. minimized the other part. Yeah. Okay. But now, okay. Uh, um, let me just run through it this way anyway. So I say, so I can save some time. Yeah. Okay. Uh, like she had said, my name is Olatunde Baba, and um, I'm presenting to you the National Gallery of Modern Arts in Lagos in the orientation of the Nigerian mind. Uh, I'd initially wanted to do the National Museum, but I had some troubles securing um, the ability to do the research with the museum at, that, at, at, at the institution. So I'm going to quickly run you through. Yeah, this is a, a cultural study and it's qualitative in nature. And for the purpose of this paper, the National Gallery of Modern Arts in Lagos may also be referred to as the, National, as the NGMEL. The article will run through the sub-themes of the creation of the country Nigeria, introduction of the National Gallery of Modern Arts, interpreting the nation by the National Gallery of Modern Arts, the National Gallery of Modern Arts in the rede redefining of yesterday's impression on today for tomorrow, nationalism and transition, the articulation of religious beliefs in the NGMEL, and the international diplomacy has been uh, uh, negotiated by the National Gallery of Arts. 
On the 1st of January, 1914, the Northern and Southern uh, Protectorates of the Geographical Expression known as Nigeria were amalgamated by Sir Frederick Lugard, the British colonial governor of Nigeria at the time. The country was further divided into six geopolitical zones out of the agitations of the diverse ethnic nationalities within the country after the 1960 independence of Nigeria. The arguments of this research are guided by the ideals of the Pan-African movement and the population of artists in focus range from those who practice through the period of the amalgamation to the regions of the regions to the independence era until the 1990s. The need to reevaluate the Nigerian identity and assert Black and African pride was achieved through Pan-African festivals after the independence of many African nations. This festival, they include the first World Festival of Black Arts in Dakar, Senegal in 1966, the first Pan-African Cultural Festival in Algiers in July 1969, and the second World Black and African Festival of Arts and Culture titled Festac in Lagos, 1977. The National Gallery of Modern Arts in Lagos was established by the Federal Department of Culture in November 1979 at the National Theatre Complex in Lagos. It was, its initial holding was derived from the National Arts Exhibition of the Second World Black and African Festival of Arts and Culture. In the sense of interpreting a nation for nation making, it, it, there's the necessity of a conscious practice of fashioning and visualizing a nation to suit certain ideals. In the works being discussed here, Nigerian artists will define they defined a new understanding of the relationship with the post-colony. They freely deployed the multiple stimuli of the artistic language of their ancestors. Europe in their alignment with the pools of blackness, Africa, the nation, and their ethnos in their address of the task of nation building through art. In the National Museum, no subject is more central to the construction of the nation than history or the handling of the past. The past can provide a powerful anchor to nationhood. History provides the enabling narrative for all nations to anchor their drive for the development of an up-to-date narrative, as it is perceived that if the nation has achieved greatness in its past, it also is capable of replicating such greatness in the contemporary situation. In the valorization of the national pride through national heroes and mythological legends, the National Gallery of Modern Art delves into the history to produce not just the portraits of modern day Nigerian leaders and nationalists, but also the portrait representations of many Nigerian pre-independent personalities and prominent Nigerian artists. An interrogation of the history paints and the collection reveals their deployment as a connection between the current political dispensation and the past heroes, kings, mythological and religious icons. This evidences them as not just imaginary or mythological paintings, but documents of history in an act to empower Nigerian modern art in the rendition or modern art renditions over the archaeological findings as a preferred medium for locating the contemporary cultural essence of the Nigerian identity. In the valorization of national pride through national heroes and mythological legends, the National Gallery of Modern Art delves into the history to produce not just the portraits of modern day Nigerian leaders and nationalists, but also portraits representations of many Nigerian pre-independent personalities and prominent Nigerian artists. An interrogation of history of the history paintings and collection reveals their deployment as connections between the current political dispensation and past heroes, kings, mythological and religious icons. This evidences them not, as, not just as imaginary or mythological paintings, but documentary in an act to empower the Nigerian modern art rendition over. I've done that before. All right. OK, um, this painting is um, this sculpture is titled um, Yemonja, and it's one of the first sculptures that you find when you come into the National Gallery. This is uh, one of those paintings that actually connects history and religion in the articulation of nationhood in the National Gallery. Here you have a painting by um, the artist, the late art, um, what's his name, Mirabo Mopai, and this is titled My Idris Aloma. Here he shows you the the um, the kind of history that Nigeria has in terms of the fact that there was a buoyant civilization 
before colonial, you know, before colonialism. Here you see Aloma as an equestrian on a horse with a garrison of army behind him. You needed to have some kind of um, some kind of civilization to be able to command this kind of legion of army behind you. For many more artists in Nigeria, such as I know Nabulu and uh, I know uh, Akin Lala Shikon and Abayamu Baba, national identity was fashioned with a dialect of negotiating their position in the national art discourse. Their depictions of key nationalist figures from all regions of Nigeria in the poetry section of the National Gallery of Modern Art was constructed as a powerful witness to the rich political past of the nation. Here we see the portrait of uh, Dr. Sapara Williams by Ainon Abulu. What was important about uh, this portrait is the fact that Sapara was at the forefront of negotiating of uh, negotiating the parity of uh, the wages of uh, Nigerian, uh, Nigerian medical personnel and the expatriates that were coming in, into Nigeria then. At that point in time, the expatriates were getting a lot more money than Nigerian um, uh, doctors and other workers. So they led the uh, agitations for equity and uh, equality in pay and all of that. This painting is titled The Nigerian Constable Under Colonial Rule by Akinola Lashikon. And uh, here he actually shows you um, the kind of attitude, the subservient attitude that we require for nation building. Uh, and then here's a portrait of Herbert Macaulay, very popular man, and uh, the father of Nigerian nationalism. Uh, Emokbai depicts, um, what's his name? Um, Macaulay here as a man of great wisdom, one who would spend a lot of time reading and equipping himself with knowledge before going out in the background to, to address the people about the process of uh, nation making. This is a portrait of uh, the late Onyo Ife Saadi Soji Adiremi. He was the first black governor of the Western region of Nigeria after the British left. In the section of the National Gallery, which deals with modern Nigerian styles and movements, the gallery exhibits a print by Bruce and Obrakbaya titled Ominira. Ominira in Yoruba means independence. It depicts the various geopolitical zones of the country in their characteristic mode of dressing, playing musical instruments that are site specific for easy recognition of the negotiations of the nation's plurality and political unity. Here you see the you see the paint uh, the, the print work by Onobrapaya, and then you see to your to your right you see the Igbo man in you know his with his musical instrument. You can see the kakaki, you know, coming into the the, the print work, the, the, the picture playing, and then to the top you can see the the Benin mask, the Benin bronzes. One of them is up there, and to the left you can I mean to the left side you can see the Yoruba man and the um, bata drum and Shekere and Shekere and the um, talking drum also at the top part of uh, this, this um, artwork. The difficult times occasioned by the civil war in the country also required negotiating. The wounded had to be healed. Those who felt ostracized needed to be reintroduced to the rest of the country. Various artists, artists produced works reflecting their feelings about the situation. Particularly interesting in this section regarding the idea of a political unification of Nigeria are the posters by Haig David West. In this one, you, you see um, Haig David West actually did a lot of paintings and, and posters with uh, titles like No More Aggression, uh, Restore Our Culture, Restore Our National Pride and Unity, and things like that. And here you see the, the, the you know, the clenched fist, which is a sign of struggle, being, you know, being caught by the sign of the, the dove, which is the sign of peace, basically. So what he's doing here, basically, is him shedding some light from the dove onto the, you know, the, the struggle, bringing peace upon the struggle and therefore asking every one of us in Nigeria at that point in time to surrender and let's give peace a chance. Yeah. 
Religion has always played a crucial role in the sponsoring of nations in many nations. It furnished the ammunition for the development of a wide repertoire of traditional art in Nigeria. And it developed social control by traditional Nigerian rulers using car paraphernalia of the masquerades and other envoys of the gods. In the articulation of the nationalism through religion, the National Gallery of Modern Art connects the formalism of the art to the articulation of the essence of the spirit of the nation and the works like Baba's sculpture title, Jemanja, and Coladio portrait painting of Bishop Samuel Ajayi Crowder. We've already seen the uh, sculpture of uh, Yemanja, but now uh, here's a um, uh, painting of uh, Samuel Ajayi Crowder by Koladi Oshinowo. Here Oshinowo depicts Crowder as a man who's full of wisdom. You know, in the African setting, age is uh, synonymous to wisdom. The older you are, the more wise you are supposed to be. And that's the reason why you find in African mythology, the tortoise is referred to as a very wise creature because it lives to be between somewhere like 300 and 400 years. So that means it's actually, you know, acquired like 400 years of experience. The admittance of works by international artists into the country national collection has been variously defended by several countries involved in this practice. Exhibiting the whole world in a single collection as a notion was flirted with considerably by many European nations in the 19th century. Some countries have these works inculcated in their national collections as signs of the colonial conquest, while others engage in collection in collecting artists from other countries as a sign of their economic might and the right to appropriate or a symbol of goodwill towards these other countries. Of very, you know, of great importance in the collection is this particular paint, uh, painting or print by Stoyan Stoyan, a Bulgarian artist. It's titled Freedom Memorial. Here you see the, the struggles of the Bulgarians uh, in their agitations against the Ottoman Turks for independence. And this was a theme that really resonated with the National Gallery of Arts at its establishment because Nigeria had just come out of uh, colonialism and we just become independent shortly before then. So this was a theme that really uh, resonated with the directors of the National Gallery at that point in time. In conclusion, the National Gallery of Modern Arts was able to con to create a narrative of the orientation of the post-colonial Nigerian mind, as the collection seeks to impart the ideals of self-consciousness to the Nigerian mind within its display. The resulting cultural fabrications were then disseminated to the public as documentary evidences for the orientation of the post-colonial Nigerian mind. This therefore positions the National Gallery of Modern Arts within the context of projects of nation making. In this respect, it's not very different in nature from the acts of nation making in National Gallery of Arts in Washington, DC in the USA. There, the collection of American art displays the founding fathers of the nation and their contributions to nation making. And it is used to inform the Americans of their common national inheritance. Indeed, these kinds of narratives are a feature of most national galleries around the world. Thank you for listening. I know I had to run through that very quickly because I, I had a lot to do and uh, I felt like I had very little time. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much for that presentation. That was actually excellent time. That was well within the 15 minutes. So thank you. Um, if you could um, unshare You're welcome. Um, we right. will go on to the next speaker and then we'll return and have questions and comments for everybody all together. Um, so thank you very much, Dr. Barber. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Okay. Um, our next speaker, who I'll now introduce, is Cindy Lee McBride. Cindy Lee McBride is a writer from Johannesburg and a PhD candidate at the Center for African Studies, University of Basel. Her research looks at the politics and poetics of climate change in South Africa and Nigeria. She holds an MA degree in international relations from the University of Witzerwerland and an MA degree 
in political communications from the University of Cape Town. And she has worked in the private nonprofit and public sectors in South Africa. Her research and writing focus on the nexus between international development and and culture. And her writing has been published in Africa as a country, New Frame, The Male and Guardian and more. If you could join me in welcoming Mrs. Cindy Lee McBride. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for the introduction. It's great to be here. Uh, let me share my screen. Um, okay, is it sharing? Yes, it's sharing very well, thank you. Okay, great. All right, so the title of my presentation is Towards a Climate Gaze in Nigerian Contemporary Art. This image is by Otobang Nkanga. It's actually a tapestry called Double Plot. Um, so this um, paper is an article in progress from my PhD dissertation. I don't really need to speak about it after that lovely introduction. Um, just to say that I'm quite interested in issues of form and poetics and aesthetics. So how the political is constituted through hermeneutic processes, I think is really interesting um, in conversations around um, climate knowledge. Um, so a very quick summary about the article is, I'm interested in pairing the gaze theory with contemporary art to expand aesthetic engagement with climate change. Um, so I discuss in detail in the paper why I turn to art to engage with climate change and which concepts I employ to develop this theory. Um, and then I discuss three Nigerian contemporary artists, Rahima Gambo, Otobongo Kanga, and Wilfred Ukpong. In this presentation, I obviously don't have that much time, so I'm only going to focus in detail on Rahima Gambo and briefly introduce the other two and of course summarize um, the detail around why combining art and climate change. Can I please ask um, whoever's not muted to please mute themselves? Okay. Um, so just to start, I mean, it's very difficult to visualize climate change. And I think that's because beyond um, extreme weather events to get form to the idea of climate and by extension climate change um, is very difficult. There's neither a complex nor a simple instrument to extend the human senses beyond just the representational image of climate. There is not, however, a growing literature that looks at how artists engage with local environmental challenges and the global climate crisis. For example, the Routledge Companion to Contemporary Art, Visual Culture and Climate Change is really useful. One second in particular is very relevant here. Um, and that section looks at sense and climate, so inquiring into cultural and artistic um, sensing practices. Uh, Tina Kempt, who's a Black feminist scholar, um, also works on multi-sensory interactions. In her book, Image Matters, she defines haptic images as those that move both through our physical encounters and through the affective investments in, that we imbue them with. So um, Kempt builds on this in a more recent book, A Black Gaze, where she looks at how um, certain contemporary artists shift the very nature of our interactions with the visual um, through creating and curating a distinctive Black gaze. So she looks at how contemporary Black produced popular culture increases visibility to the Black experience, but doesn't necessarily challenge traditional ways of narrating that experience. And I've been thinking that it's quite similar with environmental art. So often, things like um, found objects or recycled material or land art, they engage with the climate crisis, but they don't challenge dominant viewing practices. So in response to this gap, I propose tethering contemporary arts to 
the theory of the gaze, not to necessarily invert structures of visual dominance, but rather to engage with another one of um, Tina Kant's terms, which is frequency. And the frequency of an image relates to the impression that that image leaves with us. Um, there's quite a bit of work in um, environmental communication and in climate communication on how art typically can have a more effective um, impact than news media, for instance, which is photographic depictions of climate. And this is because visual art typically employs a range of different analogies or narratives that are not as easy to communicate in conventional communication. Um, so just to talk about the move from sensing and the gaze to a climate gaze, I mean, historically, a, a, a very useful historical account of the gaze um, is by Margaret Olin, who looks at how um, essentially this is an attempt to, um, or the theory of the gaze is an attempt to address ethical issues that can be read through a visual analysis of the work. So the gaze is most often applied um, to photography and to film. It's very popular in feminist film theory. Um, but Kant broadens it in her work on a black gaze. She broadens this concept by looking at blackness instead of gender. She also expands the conventional application, taking it away from lens-based art forms to include a range of artistic practices. These include performance, sculpture, sound installations, it's even a music video thrown in there. Um, so following Kant, I propose thinking of a climate gaze along similar contours. So looking at artists working in different media who offer a structure of visual engagement that embraces the multiplicity of environmentalisms and climate knowledges. Can I change now? Um, okay. Um, a climate gaze, as I'm conceiving of it, can also be thought of as an ecology of practices. So this is a phrase coined by philosopher of science, Isabel Stingers, to denote a tool for thinking through what is happening. So I discuss how the three artists offer tools to think with and about environmental degradation and climate change, instead of simply recognizing and representing the causes and effects thereof. Thinking with the surroundings as advocated by Stingers demands an awareness of environment, both literally and in terms of the politics of place. The selected works of all three artists are site specific, either in their production or in their subject matter. So the first artist, Rahima Gambo, um, this work is called Acting Out the Poem. Um, I'll just leave it up while I talk a bit um, so that I don't bombard you with text. Um, but she's a visual artist and a documentarian. Her roots are in photojournalism. Um, and this photo comes from a series called Tatsunia, which is translated as Tales in Hausa. It's an ongoing collaboration between the artists and students from Northeastern Nigeria. So the photo series was initiated after she produced another work called Education is Forbidden that was really well received. It was well funded by the International Women's Media Foundation. And in that work, she was investigating what it means to be a student living in the midst of the Boko Haram conflict. But when I spoke with her, because I did quite an in-depth interview, she explained that she was really troubled by that project, by the mechanisms of storytelling with an imposed agenda of communicating for news. You know, there's a spectacularization of the violence that becomes Im embedded in the work itself. So she decided to go back and continue um, working with the same group of students over a longer period of time and to rethink the mechanisms used to capture their stories. What this means then is that she really started thinking about what exactly is collaboration? What is the environment that you work in? What does it actually mean to stay with the trouble over a long time? And the result of that is that moving away from a more conventional journalistic style has given range to a really fertile environment in which where the work with the girls takes place has as much presence as the girls themselves. This is from the same series. Um, a recent exhibition by Gambo um, in Johannesburg called Bird Sound Orientation built on this um, 
attempt to subvert linear narratives in storytelling. She builds on this Tatsunia series by including two-dimensional works that combine found imagery sourced from Nigerian science textbooks, urban planning manuals, and school coloring books. So the collages that she makes are then immersed in these photographs taken with the students and other photographs from a walk, which is her multimedia narrative mechanism. So what she explained is that her daily practice of walking gave rise to asking questions about photography beyond the image. You know, what does it mean to be materially grounded and present in work critically? Or to put it differently, what is my ecological approach in which I'm completely part of this ecosystem making the story? So here's an example of one of the collages. Um, and what she described and what you can see looking at the work is, in addition to this very lush photography and these collages, um, her walking as a narrative mechanism offers quite a compelling range of different practices that form an immersive ecology, what she describes as a third territory that lies outside the standardized or normative forms of communication. This includes installation work like this. This is an installation view um, from the exhibition. And in the background of the image, there's a three channel video work called Instruments of Air. In the foreground is an installation nest works and wonder lines, which is constituted of clay, soil and copper. Both of these were made during a residency in Burkina Faso um, and are solely a production of her walks through this very rural land landscape. So the video features um, this outstretched hand um, moving through the landscape, holding various objects that are then identifiable in the um, installation on the floor. Uh, all of these elements um, were sourced on site. Um, the soil, the clay was um, produced at the residency. The copper was smelted. And what she explained is that when she was making the photographic series Tatsunia with the girls, she started feeling like she was hitting the limits of language and then started thinking, how could she collect language? You know, on these walks, when she's picking up things on the ground, what does it mean to rather think about putting together an account of an experience of a place in terms of its weather, in terms of its land, in terms of engagement with the body? Um, what she does, in addition to her own practice, is host public walk workshops where she invites people to walk in an environment of their choice with an accompanying audio. And one of the questions she asks on these walks in this audio is, can we walk as a response? And through this, her constellation of sonic, tactile and spatial explorations um, and collection of objects on these walks become integrated into her drawings, into her photography, into her installations. And together they demonstrate the kind of hapticity that Camp describes. This intimacy of walking slowly, of being mindful of place, of having a very situated embodied experience can be thought of as a representational repose to, or an opportunity to translate the kind of slow violence, which is a phrase coined by Rob Nixon to talk about um, how a lot of environmental damage and the creep of the climate crisis is often imperceptibly slow. You know, you can't immediately see it. If it's not a hurricane or it's not like a wildfire, it's a slow violence that's very difficult to um, be cognizant of. So in this sense, uh, Gamble's walks can be thought of a as a form of environmental data capturing. Through her sensing and through the psychology of practice, she offers really varied visual interpretations that illustrate how a climate gaze can introduce alternate narratives. And you can see this isn't explicit, you know, it's not like this very like um, intense documentation of environmental harm or like dramatic climate events. But what she does is she asks what new directions, what new ways of seeing are possible when we reorient our bodies as not separate from, but with the subject of our focus. Um, yeah, okay. So she demonstrates um, climate gaze as a visual structure of engagement through this kind of novel narrative mechanism like walking. The second artist, 
Oh, I'm so sorry, I didn't change the heading. Um, this is Wilfred Upang. And compared to Gambo's more nuanced engagement with environment, um, he has an interrelated body of work set in the night delta, and it can unequivocally be described as a visual meditation on environmental crisis in the region. There's like very li limited nuance here. It's graphic, the color choices are very vivid, the imagery is like super evocative. Um, and what he, how he's been described as bringing together aspects of Afrofuturism and mysticism to poetically reflect um, on environmental damage that's happened and continues to happen in the region. So my interest in his work is not, however, in this aesthetic mode or this representation of ecology politics, but rather in its foundation of social practice. So Opong is also um, an academic and his doctoral research is concerned with developing a series of interrelated um, context specific practice based inquiries that explore alternate creative interventions that can bring together art visually um, and social work. So during an interview with him, he explained that he's got these five experimental um, projects that reject how contemporary art in Africa gets fetishized as a commodity object. Instead, he thinks of these projects as mediating objects. So they're, they're intended to be catalysts for conversation and they involve, so they're five projects. They involve um, a performance, a participatory performance workshop with um, about a hundred local youth. There's a sonic experiment that involves a sound workshop again with youth. There's an interlinked art photographic and film project um, that's co-conceived with youth. These are all youth from the region, right? Um, and then there is a series of performance interventions that have taken place outside of Nigeria. Um, and a newly established nonprofit art and creative cultural center. So there's quite a bit of range, right? Um, and what I find really interesting about this, I mean, there's a lot to be said about the visual language and the motifs. Um, of course, the color, each of them are, are quite um, continually used, the composition. But I think more pressing is the way that he's framed the combination of these projects as an attempt to create a blueprint um, to guide socially engaged um, oil producing communities in the Niger Delta to challenge existing oppressive structures. I mean, those oppressive structures could be environmental, they could be climate, they could be economic. One of the workshops actually is intended as a support program to offer um, participating youth insights into social enterprise development. Um, but I think that what's interesting here is that um, his work offers an opportunity to expand the notion of a climate gaze to from purely visual to something more socially applied. Um, this is interesting for going a climate gaze, you know, it's obviously about situated knowledge, but it can also be about um, you know, beyond the artistic work, you know, what does it mean to Im embed this kind of research or this kind of artistic practice within um, community concerns or social dynamics? And then onto the third one, um, yeah. so um, this work is called Kola Night Tales. It's also a tapestry. So here I'm interested in a term called visual currencies. Um, and this is a reference to an exchange of values. Um, the term is coined by, coined, um, by Nomusa Makubu, um, specifically in reference to the photographic medium, um, where she was trying to, or she does speak about the representational value system in contemporary photography. Um, so uh, Nkanga is really interesting because her work fits seamlessly within art value systems. She's highly prized, she's extremely successful, but she simultaneously challenges a lot of commodity value chains. So she has a long, long enduring thematic interest in the, to, in the twin forces of colonialism and extraction. And she uses her own body as a landscape for a landscape for performance. Um, 
What I think is really interesting is in looking at these kind of environmental relations, exploitative practices in extractive industries, um, could also be a way in to talk about an analysis of the art market. The reason for that is there's increased attention to what the art in industry um, means in terms of climate responsibility. So just think about climate impact of shipping art, like the carbon cost of that's really high. Um, art industry, air, air travel, um, the kind of materials that are used in work. So all of these things are like, um, I mean, these aren't new conversations, this kind of climate awareness in terms of industry practice um, has been taking place for some time, but what does it mean to look at an artist who challenges um, extractive practices in other industries and use that as an opportunity to, to be a bit more critical and, and look a bit more closely at art industry? What does it mean to turn a climate gaze to the art industry? What visual currencies might emerge from this kind of analysis? These are some of the questions I have for this section. Um, and my interest here is that Utubangan Kanga acts, uh, or she's been described um, as operating like a scientist. You know, she's got this very forensic gaze. She's mapping, she's connecting dots, she's looking at socioeconomic, cultural, political implications of chosen artifacts. And what does it mean if you turn that gaze to the visual currencies contained within her own paintings? Um, so, for example, or oh, her own works, not just paintings. Um, this image um, was accompanied by a performance called Contained Measures of a Colonite, where she sat for hours at a table that displayed objects that were like uh, Opong's mediating objects. Uh, Nkanga sat at this table with all these objects intended as catalysts for dialogue, including colonite. Um, so in this work, then, she looks at how the harvesting and transportation of the colonite and its cultural significance in Nigeria is a way to look into, um, you know, just economies of resources. What then does it mean to look at an economy of her own work as a resource? Um, then, so these are uh, uh, propositions. Um, I'm, I have not yet interviewed her. I haven't I'm been able to do that yet. So um, I haven't been able to analyze as deeply as with the other two. This is still an expanding section of the paper. But just in conclusion, I mean, the three artists, I think, offer situated opportunities through their work um, to exercise, as Anna Ting puts it, the art of noticing. So their respective ecologies of practice highlight um, ways of engaging with key debates related to environmentalism and climate change, from capitalism to colonialism to sensorial knowledge as environmental data. Um, so the three things I looked at and I plan to explore deeply are Rahima Gambo's walking as a narrative mechanism, Wilfred Ukpang's social practice, and Otobang and Kanga's visual currencies. So together, the three present a case for a climate gaze as a structure of visual engagement that embraces the multiplicity of environmentalisms and climate knowledges. Thanks. I hope I have kept time. Um, you went a little bit over. I'm oh, a, no, I'm so sorry. Yeah. I tried. Um, OK, thank you for that presentation. Uh, we will have to kind of speed through a little bit. I'm not sure how much time we'll have for um, discussion at the end, but um, let's go on to our next presenter. Um, uh, just a brief introduction, and then I'll ask that he share his screen and give his presentation, assuming you have a PowerPoint to show us. Um, Owata Onajeru is a postgraduate researcher at the Department of Philosophy, University of Ibadan. His areas of research interest cuts across the subfields of political philosophy, social epistemology, and legal philosophy. If you could please share your screen with us, um, success, and um, begin your presentation.
apologies. I think we're having a little bit of a technical difficulty. Um, success, are you there? Can you unmute your audio and we can hear you? If our um, in-house tech, <laughs> Saheed, if you're there, could you unmute success? Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. Good evening. Okay. Uh, sorry, I, I seem to have a terrible network glitch. Uh, let me, so my video would be uh, turned off while I, I just could be, as much as possible to share my screen. All right. We're having trouble hearing you. Um, are you able to? Are you able to hear us? Goodness. Okay, I think we've lost success for now. Um, we'll return to him um, shortly. Hopefully he'll be able to resolve his network issues, um, but we'll leave time for him at the end in case he's able to rejoin us. Um, in the meanwhile, let's go on to our next speaker um, and then we'll just keep on with the regular program until we're able to regain, um, regain service with success. Okay. Dr. Olakule Shokoya is a sociologist by destiny who was trained at Olabisi Onabajo University in Nigeria and the University of Ibadan in Nigeria. He's currently a postgraduate student at the Department of Sociology, Faculty of the Social Sciences, University of Ibadan in Nigeria. He majors in the area of sociology of development and political sociology. His specific areas of interest includes development, protests, rural and urban studies, politics and governance, gender studies, crime, social theory, and social research. If you could please welcome Dr. Shokoya, who's with us. I think we've lost him as well. Hmm. Terrible day for network. Okay. Yes, so we'll continue. <laughs> and hopefully we can circle back to all of our missing um, panelists. Um, I guess we'll go to our, our last speaker. Um, are we, are we ready? Yes, I think he's here, okay. Okay. Um, Dr. Tululokwe Shobale, he teaches sculpture and art history at the Department of Fine and Applied Arts at Olabisi Onabajo University in Obu State. His research interest is focused on metal art, sociology of art, with emphasis in contemporary Nigerian art and artists. He is currently undergoing his PhD in African Art Studies at Obafa Miawolowo University in Ileife, Oshun States. Please, if you could 
share your screen with us so we can see your presentation. And please feel free to begin whenever you're ready. Thank you. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on the area you are in the world. Um, I'm happy to be at this great panel to share my paper with every one of you listening to me. The title of my paper is Ola Dele Obeyemi Metaphoric Mobile Arts. Um, my abstract says that meta exploration for creative purpose is an end long practice in Nigeria. However, Oladele of Bayamis of the mobile art piece is considered an unusual. Wait. Is considered unusual because the work is unique. Uh, and again, this piece has within it many others with synchronized philosophical narratives hammer on the decadence of the artist's social, political, and economic issues that deserve attention as much as the aesthetics appear in the total form of their work. The study set out to bring to fore the embedded expressive contents in the automobile arts as it relates to the artist built environment for better understanding of his efforts and contributions in making his society a better place without jettisoning the types of material he has blocked. The study aims at examining the mobile art of Oladele Ogbeyemi with a view to bring into fore the embedded philosophical insight in the piece, thereby placing the works and the artist's contribution in the right perspective in his environment and in contemporary weathered metal practice in Nigeria. Generally, choosing visual arts as a career in Nigeria often met with issues because parents often disagree with their children choosing fine art as a career. However, this, these issues actually started during the colonial period and the incursion of the missionaries in Nigeria. The, the missionaries succeeded in influencing the people who are actually traditional worshipers. And in the moment they succeeded in converting them to adopt foreign religion as an alternative to reaching God, those people, services were no more needed as it was before the influence of the missionaries on them, and thereby the covers who are executing the images were relegated in the society. But same thing, the, missionar the missionaries and the colonial also opened some other avenue for people to source for their daily living by providing other sources of job. And this therefore influenced people to migrate. Popularly, people at their prime it migrated from the rural area to urban, leaving the aged people with their with themselves in the village. So that is how the issue started then. But Oladeli Osbeyemi's journey into the visual arts started in the city of Lagos as an apprentice under his own father. The father is an auto mechanic, but Oladeli Osbeyemi always stayed with his father 
exploring the waste from the vehicles that are no more useful in making some images. And because of this, the father discovered that he, he is not capable to continue mentoring the child as the child continues to grow. And therefore, he decided to take him to the Universal Studio of Arts and handed him over to Fidelis Ogogo, who is actually one of the foremost contemporary weather metal artists we have in Nigeria as an apprentice. So therefore, started his career in the field of arts as an apprentice. Apprentice system of learning is a process of developing from novice proficiency under the guidance of a skilled experts. Umuru classified apprenticeship system into two types, conservation and the labor. Therefore, having started his journey from his father and later under the tutelage of Fidelis or Dogos fall into the two classifications of Umuru because the conservative method is the actual traditional method the Yorubas engage in mentoring a trainees to become a master because it becomes a family affair. They don't allow eyesight to join them in learning the skill. Why the Libra is an open door method which allows anyone, regardless of the background, regardless of the blood relations, to come and learn this skill of a particular job. On the select, this selected artist, there are a lot of materials on him. However, these materials all focused on his developmental background. The type of material Oladele is using and his interest in use in animal using animal as subjects. However, they omit vital information such as its expressive, the expressive content on the works of this body artist. And that is one of the reasons that interest and uh, inspire this paper to come to be. Look at the expressive content. Oladele Ogbemi was born in 1992. He studied fine general art at Lagos State Polytechnic, now Lagos State University of Science and Technology, and later moved to Yaba College of Technology for his HND in 2015 and 2018, respectively. He specialized in sculpture at Yaba College of Technology. He has many groups exhibitions and a solo exhibition to his credit. He has won award for his creative ingenuity. This is the automobile art, which actually brought the, the brought demand Oladele Obeyemi into limelight in the year 2020, while he was on his uh, NIC in Nigeria. This particular piece has a lot of other works that are attached to it. And this work took him five years to complete as, according to him, he started all those pieces of work attached to this to make this a whole from 2015. These are the list of the works that are, there are seven works that I identified right now. The roaster, the dogs, fish, spider, bull, eagle, and guns uh, are these other works that makes the complete work in one piece. Roaster, according to me, which I titled um, LA Riser. If you look at the situation in Nigeria, you see that very early, 4 a.m., 5 a.m., people are already on the move just to go and meet 
uh, and do their uh, daily job and satisfy every other things. But despite the fact that this is happening, uh, there is a lot of issues going on with us. And that I want to link up with these two dogs attached to the vehicle or the rear. These two dogs, I refer to them as non-conformists because that's why the fact that a lot of people are very are struggling to achieve. There are other people who are moving in the wrong direction. It is expected that if a hunter goes to hunt with dogs, it is expected that the dogs take to instructions of the hunter. But if you look at this one, there is not going to be a success because the vehicle is moving towards right. These dogs are moving towards another direction. And that will mean that we give a fruitless exercise at the end of the day. And again, this fish attached to the vehicle at the other side, I look at it and I look at the fish scale is facing the other way around. Rather than the scale to face backward, the scale of this fish is moving, is, is facing towards the ocean. And that is a negative drive. That's why all the gadgets, all these resources, this it, that is available to this particular thing, it's, a, it's just a metaphor because we have human power, we have everything, but are they actually channeling their power, their strength, their focus in the right direction to achieve what is expected? The answer to me is no. And because of this, there are a lot of things happening in Nigeria, like this spider, according to the artist, the title is spider. But when I look at it critically, I discover that this is more than a spider. Because if you look at what is going on around in Nigeria, particularly as I'm speaking to you right now, where there is a serious short, uh, acute shot of fuel in the, in the nation, why is that happening for an oil producing country like Nigeria? All of our refineries, there has been in an abandoned situation, and therefore they have dilapidated beyond real uh, performance. So, and generally, where you see a spider and cobwebs, it means that place has been abandoned for 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 so long. Because where people are occupying, where activities are going on, there will be maintenance that will deprive such a thing to be. There will be a, a, a state of dilapidation, a state of abandonment, like we are having it in our country, and which is setting us back uh, uh, unexpectedly. Again, this is a bull, which I look at metaphorically compared to our strengths. We so have we have animal strengths that deserve to give us a Sussex. But how are we using the strengths? If we look at the security sector, sector in Nigeria, what are they doing with all this banditry, uh, terrorist attack every day? They are not using their strengths as expected. You can see, according to this artist, Oladele, he said it was the killing of 2020, the NSAS killing in Lekki that inspired him to, have, to think of putting gun on the roof of the, of the car, that instead of these people using the uh, gun to kill bandits, they are using it against innocent civilians that are harmless. So they are just wasting the strength rather than using it successfully. Uh, also, if you look at this particular one, this ego, which, which happens to be the center of focus of this world, because when you look at this ego, you may come who does not actually know the, how to interpret all those, all those other subjects are just 
spoken about, we just look at it and rest on this ego alone. And I title this ego from my own perspective as wasted energy and resources. The ego is so powerful, so energetic, yet it couldn't fly. You can see that the wings are resting on the bonnet, and that is uh, uh, an evidence that the wing, the, the ego, has more than what it can chew. If, if you look at this, behind the ego are other energetic things that shows that inside the, the, the ego, there are a lot of strengths, but something is weighing the ego down from flying, and that is exactly what we have. We have a lot of resources in Nigeria. Why are we suffering? If you ask that question, why are Nigerians suffering? Why are they struggling to move out of Nigeria at all costs? And if you look at it, I come to this vehicle eventually. Now, it's no more functioning on the road. All the interiors have been removed uh, to make this work a real antiquity for the luckiest person that can afford to buy it. The work is currently at the Signature Gallery at Ikoi. If you look at it, this is a, an empty something. Whereas if you look at the vehicle from afar, it, at the external part of it is very pleasing, very nice, but hook in reality. This is what they call, Yoruba will refer to as empty barrier, about before that you, you, have, you are just making noise. No results to show for all the strengths in you, or you are, you are saying. And conclude, if my conclusion is this, these young artists have done his best through the types of material use, being a junk, he has saved the environment of a lot of issues by converting those junks into aesthetics objects. And also his expressive content is very impressive. I hope the people concerned can have uh, listening here to get all this information and reflect on them positively because uh, all I've said, in my view, I've pointed to the fact that the artist has justified using all those objects together. Yes, the works give us a very good aesthetic value, uh, aesthetic pleasure, but at the end of the day, the, the in-depth aspect of it is that it is just a beauty for nothing. Uh, like people Yoruba will say, Emma Torie wa fe ayasile iwane wu. Can this vehicle move despite all the beauty thing, all the beautiful things attached to it? It cannot move. Thank you. Thank for you. Listening. Thank you very much for that presentation. Um, if you could unshare your screen, um, we will go on to the final presentation. Unfortunately, I've just been reminded that we only have 10 minutes remaining for this panel. So um, I'm not sure that we'll have, I, I know for certain we will not have time for questions. Um, but I will do my best to help us get through this um, with success. Um, and success is, next, is our next speaker. Since I've introduced you already, I won't take any more time to introduce you again. I'll just say that I'll be sharing the screen um, for success so that you can uh, have him share his audio without um, much difficulty. So hopefully you can see the screen. Success when you're ready, please unmute yourself and keep in mind that we do have only 10 minutes, so you may have to um, make some speed, get through this in some speed. So thank you. All right. All right. Yeah, thank you very much. And uh, I apologize for the network glitches. Uh, it's been quite uh, raining in a little bit over here. And so, all right. I've worked on uh, metamodernism and the reality of a virtual future. My work actually takes a little bit. Uh, differentiation from the focal points of the previous presentation. My interrogation focuses more on the reality of the three, what have been called three ideological routines that guides our modern or our present um, interrogations in both the arts and cultural theory 
and as well as uh, philosophy, I would I, I try to distinguish between each of these three concepts as being guiding principles, as well as interrogatory method through which we could be able to understand each of our works. So in this presentation, I intend to explicate the idea of metamodernism. I would also intend to engage with the stylistic distinctions between the modern, the postmodern, and the metamodern. Uh, the problem which we, we would be interrogating is the fact that in a bid to conceptualize our present reality, uh, scholars and the course philosophers have come up with different ideas or we will call it nomenclature detonations that is naming for how humans respond to the acts. And lastly, we intend to talk about the notion of the virtual. Now, this is seen more as different from, uh, let's say, the acts per se or the virtual act is seen as something that has gone viral or something that, I mean, something that has gone cyber. So we are intending to see the world as our, the social, as no longer being interrogations between individuals one after the other. Please, next slide. We are seeing the social as being interrogations between people on a new level. So it's been termed as the new social, which is the virtual world. And that is the point of my interrogation. So first of all, we intend to see the word modernism as uh, depicting three basic ideas. Now, modernism most especially depicts a generic concept which intends to capture, like I've said, the basic trends in human history, first of all. Secondly, modernism is seen as a philosophical concept, uh, most especially an epistemological concept, which has to do with an idea on knowing or understanding. So it, we, it, we, it, it intends to conceptualize what constitutes knowledge for each system or cultural trends in human societies. And thirdly, uh, we intend to see the modernism as being just a nomenclature, just a name, a name that I attempt to depict an idea or a group of uh, closely related interrogations. Uh, next slide, please. And now, um, Apart from the concept of the modernism, next we deal with the three basic concepts, which is modernism itself as a concept, postmodernism, and then metamodernism. So modernism as a concept is seen basically as a, a two-way uh, uh, idea. First of all, it's seen as a historical concept and an, an ideological construct. So as a historical concept, modernism intends to encapsulate um, an age of what has been called an age of enlightenment is seen first of all as beginning from an age of enlightenment or it is seen as beginning from what we call a linguistic tone that is a tone whereby positive thought began to be the predominant idea or predominant methodology in our interrogations so uh, uh, the scientific method has become uh, uh, becomes the core and the focal point of every methodology and every, um, would we say, uh, every basic engagement with concepts or social constructs. Now, modernism is also seen as an ideological construct. Now, as an ideological construct, modernism depicts a one single methodology, which is a methodology of absolutism. Uh, by absolutism, we mean that uh, modernism intends to depict the uh, reality of something being absolute. So there is an absolute truth. There is an absolute reality. Uh, there's just a one single point to which every human must come to. Next slide, please. So, now, uh, I intended to uh, bring in a circular notation, uh, in a circular movement, the, the flow of modernist ideas. To say modernism has to do with uh, absolutism, it also has to do with what we call humanism. Of course, humanism, the belief that human is at the center of the universe, human is at the center of creation, which is a belief that cuts across a majority of our cultures uh, and a majority of our traditions, of course, even here in Africa. It also has to do with positivism and it has to do with uh, globalism. Please, the next slide. But when we bring it down or narrow down the modernist concepts into our own Africa idea and interrogate what I have what have been termed as the 
the modern KOS. KOS here, KOS here refers to knowledge organization system. And so uh, I intend to, uh, or I argue that the modernist knowledge organization system is in three ways. First of all, it deals with a colonial mentality. So it would group in every, um, every paradigm of culture, every paradigm of art that has to depict a colonial entity uh, as being a modern era or of being part of, the, of modernism as an idea rather as being a historical construct. Uh, secondly, it deals with uh, early African nationalism. And thirdly, modernism deals with the concept of Afrocentricism. So that is the concept of Africa being at the centerpiece of our interrogations. So, of course, we understand that Afrocentricism has been a uh, faced uh, uh, critique from scholars as being an African ground of ethnocentricism. Next slide, please. I would quickly, for time's sake, want to run through postmodernism before I can quickly lay the bedrock of metamodernism. And I will just do that very fast. So, postmodernism is an idea which sees um, knowledge construction or social organization as being void of anything absolute or any single methodology. So, postmodernism enacts more of what we call relativism. That is to say that uh, there's relative truth, there's relative um, um, knowledge. Knowledge in itself is relative, truth is relative. So it's more of a 20th, okay, it's, it's more of a 20th century ideology. So postmodernism encapsulates the ideology which is seen as anti-modernism. So it gives a leeway for every culture and every tradition to be able to push forth their idea as being standard and not being substandard as the uh, modern era tried to create that kind of a dichotomy between a standard culture and a substandard culture, which I wouldn't want to go into. Next slide, please. Uh, so under postmodernism, I intended to create a schema also, we should see a pointer of postmodern ideas has been based on relativism, first of all. And uh, secondly, it's based on a notion of anti-humanism. So anti-humanism here, um, it, it's been pushed to an extent beginning from the, I think the 1970s, uh, uh, from the work of Donna Haraway that talked about uh, taking off the human entity from being at the centerpiece of the universe. So, so we are no longer seeing man as being the centerpiece of the universe in anti-humanist perspective. And some methodology also sees the non-existence of a single method. And thirdly, uh, the concept of globalization, uh, which is it, technically, it, it, it has been pushed as being a concept which tended to create a hegemony. But I, I intend to argue, or I have argued in, in other papers, uh, not presentations, that uh, Globalization and globalism tend to present two different dichotomic standards. So globalism in itself presents that hegemonic standard that has to do with uh, modernism. Why globalization begins to incorporate even standards from non-Western perspective. Next slide, please. And uh, in interrogating the postmodern KOS, I present the perspective that the postmodern era would deal with the post-colonial, uh, that is at, at the point of aggressive nationalism and indigenization. So here it should also deal with the point of Afropolitanism. You know, the, uh, the idea which has been credited to Taya Selassie of the Afropolitan, which is an African who cuts from different culture, who, who is not just an African in, in, uh, in uh, we we'll say in identity per se, he's a mixture or she's a mixture of different identities. So that is the Afropolitan. And thirdly, in, as a political movement, uh, the postmodern era sees uh, African moving away from the hegemonic standards of the East or the Western bloc and creating or aligning themselves as being more of non-participants in the affairs of, uh, in, in global political affairs. The question one may ask is how does this relate to Nigeria or how does this relate to the point of our discussion in this conference? Uh, the next slide, please. Now, in, in each of 
what I have tried to do, I have tried to point out that we have a modern era which deals with a standardized pattern, an absolute model of um, knowledge creation. We have a postmodern era which deals with an anti-modern standard. Now, my point of metamodernism here deals with not just a linguistic concept, it also deals with a philosophical and a virtual concept. The argument here is the fact that the world as it is, or the, the uh, human development has already begun to transcend the levels of the social now, and it's now dwelling in the cyber. So this brings the concept of the virtual. Now, metamodernism, as uh, uh, it, it, it first appeared in the works of um, Timothy uh, Vermeulen and uh, Robin de Acker in their work, nine, the 2010 um, paper, Notes on, Modern, um, Notes on Metamodernism, there they laid the groundwork for an idea which intends to capture a recent cultural trend, a recent cultural trend which has no linkage to uh, the modern or the postmodern. Now it's seen as merging both the modern and the postmodern. Now, in this point in time, we are seeing that the social is no longer driven by human interactions anymore. The point here is that the social has begun to shift into the virtual. So the intent that it is now, to a large extent, the, uh, the happenings on the virtual fair that determine and predetermine the happenings on the social fair and vice versa. So we could see that in the NSAS movement which technically wasn't a, a movement of, uh, 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 I mean, which wasn't a protest led by one particular individual. It started as a virtual movement and gained momentum. And now it has become a subject or a turning point in both the political and, uh, and the academic sector of Africa. So I want to push off the argument to say that, uh, this if we could just run to the last slide where I, I, I for time's sake. Now, I want to push off the argument to say that uh, metamodernism here deals with the notion that human knowledge, human society, human understanding of reality, it's now being based on what we could connote as a cyber culture. So in interrogating or in understanding the trends of our modern society, we must also learn or we must also need to interrogate what goes on or how the cyber culture shapes the basic understanding of even our cultural phenomenon. For example, uh, in, in, a, in, a, in, in a society like the, the, uh, the southern part of Nigeria, um, so the south-south of Nigeria, a state like Delta State, for example, we've had uh, more scenarios whereby culture or cultural trends have been totally altered to a large extent by trends which comes from the virtual. So we see a... So thank you very much. I think uh, uh, my time is up and uh, thank you very much for that. My apologies for the network. Uh, thank you so much for the, for the presentation. I'm so sorry that we didn't get to complete and conclude um, the way that we would like. I will actually be sending my own comments to all of the presenters because I had a lot of different um, um, insights and, and comments for you all. So you'll be getting emails from me shortly and hopefully that will, that will make up for the lack of discussion that we had in this. But it was so good to meet you all. Thank you all to all of our, our attendees and to our presenters. And I wish you all for the rest of the conference. <laughs> Thank you so much for your wonderful chairing. Thank you for chairing the, the panel. Yeah, you've done a really good work. Thank you. Thank Thanks you all. Lot. Thank you all. Thank you all. Success, you'll be hearing Thank from you. Okay. Thank you very much for okay. giving us your time. And for and supporting, supporting LSA to share this panel. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you all for your contributions. I'll see you all in the remainder of the conference. All right. All right. Bye bye. Bye. Bye bye. Bye. Good evening.